everybody. Uh, this, this is Alice Gandelman from the California Prevention Training Center. We're very happy that everybody here has joined us for our webinar on improving STD screening and uh, STD screening and HIV care. I am going to turn it over to Majel Arnold, who's going to introduce the webinar at the Office of AIDS Care Branch. Majel, are you there? Majel, um, I'm wondering if your phones are on mute by any chance? I think while we're waiting for, um, for Majel to get sound, um, I'll introduce, um, tell you a little bit about um, our speaker today. Um, we are going to okay. be uh, speaking. Oh. Hi, Alice. This is Majel. I think, um, can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Oh, fantastic. Okay, great. Um, so, yeah, we had our technical assistance person here who helped us out on this. <laughs> Thank you, Marjorie. <laughs> Um, so good morning, everyone. So are you? Um, so should I go ahead and just get started? Yes. Okay. Great. So good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this webinar. Um, I am Majel Arnold, and I'm the chief of the care branch of the California Department of Public Health, and the Office of AIDS. I oversee the Ryan White Part B HIV Care Program, the AIDS Medi-Cal Waiver Program, and the Care Housing Unit, which also includes the housing opportunities for persons with AIDS. We also refer to as HOPWA. Some of you may be aware that the Ryan White Part B's Clinical um, Quality Management Program and the California Prevention Training Center are currently working together on a quality improvement project to improve STD screening in two of our Ryan White Part B funded clinics. The main goal of this project is to increase gonorrhea and chlamydia extragenital or three-point testing, that is screening of urethral, pharyngeal, and rectal sites in men who have sex with men and who are living with HIV. This project supports the STD screening objectives that are listed in, our, in the California's 2017-21 Integrated Plan and also STD screening performance measures recommended by HRSA, Health Resources and Services Administration, for patients who served under Ryan White funding. So if you haven't had a chance to see our California's Integrated Plan, there is a PDF copy on the pod label resources, and it's located on the right-hand side of your screen. The Office of AIDS partnered with CAPTC for this project because of their extensive expertise in this area. The CAPTC has done a lot of work to increase the knowledge and skills of healthcare providers in the area of sexual health, including extragenital screening of chlamydia and gonorrhea. So it is a great pleasure to introduce our partner, Alice Gandelman, who you've heard earlier on the call, who is the director of the California Prevention Center and to tell you more about the project and to, and to introduce our webinar presenter. Alice? Thanks, Majel. Um, and hello again, everybody. I'm very um, happy uh, to welcome you to our webinar on improving STD screening in HIV care. Dr. Stoltley will be speaking about a number of, an important, of important STD screening areas, including extragenital screening and sexual history taking. Julie Stoltley um, is a physician and a public health medical officer at the California Department of Public Health in the STD control branch. She's also our clinical factory at the California Prevention Training Center, and I'm happy to say that she has also just stepped in as our medical director, so we're really excited to have Julie Stoltley um, with us in that capacity as well. She's also assistant clinical professor, professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases at UCSF. In addition to her primary role with the STD control branch, she also attends on the Infectious Disease Service at the San Francisco VA Medical Center, so she's got a lot of um, uh, experience to share with us. Um, and just to say a little bit about our clinical training center, um, we are one of eight national training centers that um, is a part of the national network of STD HIV prevention training centers who work with health providers who diagnose, treat, and manage patients with STDs and HIV. So we do a lot of HIV, STD interactive work around PrEP, PEP, and um, a variety of STD issues. So without further ado, I think I will pass it on to Julie. Julie? Great. Thank you very much. We'll just load up our slides and get moving. So.
I'm going to start by covering epidemiologic trends in chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis among men who have sex with men. Then review screening recommendations for STDs, including rectal and pharyngeal gonorrhea and chlamydia, discuss methods and best practices for routinely conducting a sexual history, and then close by reviewing recommended therapy for gonorrhea and chlamydia, and also highlight a couple of examples of complicated STD infections. So let's take a look at the data. This slide shows trends in chlamydia, gonorrhea, and early syphilis, which is infectious syphilis acquired in the last year, in California over the last 25 years. You can see that chlamydia has been increasing over most of that time period, with more recent increases in gonorrhea and syphilis. Focusing in on chlamydia, this slide shows chlamydia incidence rates in California, demonstrated by the blue line, and the United States, demonstrated by the red dotted line, from 1990 to 2015. Chlamydia remains the most common reportable disease in California, and in 2015 was at its highest level since reporting was mandated in 1990. Here you see chlamydia incidence rates by gender, with higher rates among women compared to men. However, the rate increase among males was 12% between 2014 and 2015, which was twice the rate increase among females, which was 6%. This slide shows chlamydia incidence rates by gender and age group for California in 2015. You can see that the highest rates are among adolescent and young women ages 15 to 24, which may partially reflect the use of reproductive health services, including chlamydia screenings for females. There are significant disparities with respect to race ethnicity for chlamydia, with the highest rates among African Americans in California. Moving on to gonorrhea, here you see gonorrhea rates in California, demonstrated by the blue line, and in the United States, demonstrated by the dotted red line, since 1941. They have largely tracked together with very significant increases in the 1970s and early 80s, then tracking down in the 1990s. But over the last several years, California has seen very sharp increases in gonorrhea. This shows gonorrhea incidence rates by gender for California from 1990 to 2015. Gonorrhea male cases more than doubled between 2011 and 2015. There were also increases in female cases, but those were of a smaller magnitude. Reasons for these increases are not yet clear, but may include increased transmission, as well as increased oral and rectal screening of men who have sex with men. The highest gonorrhea rates for males were among ages 25 to 29, followed by those in their early 20s, then 30. For females, the highest rates were among ages 20 to 24. When California receives notification of gonorrhea cases, Frequently, the confidential morbidity report, or the CMR, is not filled out and we do not get information about gender of sex partners. I'll just make a quick plug to remind healthcare providers to fill out your CMRs when you diagnose a case so that we can collect this information. We do have the California gonococcal surveillance system where we conduct enhanced surveillance on a random sample of gonorrhea cases in California in order to gather information that we wouldn't get from routine reporting by interviewing patients and their providers. On the left, you can see that from standard surveillance information, out of all male gonorrhea cases in California, the vast majority have unknown gender of sex partners, and it looks like only 9% of gonorrhea cases occur in men who have sex with men. However, from the interviewed cases in the California gonococcal surveillance system, we learned that approximately 54% of gonorrhea cases among men in California were in MSM, and an additional 9% were in men who have sex with both men and women. Here is additional information from the California gonococcal surveillance system, which shows that almost half of positive gonorrhea tests from men who have sex with men were from rectal and pharyngeal sites without a positive urine site. For females and men who have sex with women, the vast majority of positive gonorrhea tests reported are from a genital source. What about HIV status? Again, using data from the California gonococcal surveillance system, 
we learn that 30% of men who have sex with men with gonorrhea were HIV positive, and approximately 70% were HIV negative. And this slide shows that among HIV negative men who have sex with men with gonorrhea in the California gonococcal surveillance system, 26% reported using PrEP in 2015, and this increased to 35% who reported using PrEP in 2016. Racial disparities persist with rates of gonorrhea among African Americans five times higher than among whites in California. Now taking a look at syphilis. This slide shows early syphilis incidence rates in California since 1941 relative to the U.S. California again with the blue line, the U.S. designated by the red line. Early syphilis cases continue to increase across all regions of California, with a 29% increase just from 2014 to 2015. The majority of syphilis cases in California are among men who have sex with men. These are national CDC data from 37 states that report on gender of sex partner. And you can see that, similarly, the majority of syphilis infections in the U.S. are among men who have sex with men. Syphilis cases nationally are increasing in every region, but the steepest increases are in the West. This again demonstrates CDC data for primary and secondary syphilis with the reported cases by sex, sexual behavior, and HIV status. You can see that among MSM, approximately half the cases are HIV positive. However, the percentage of cases that are HIV positive is much smaller among men, women and men who have sex with only women. These are California data, and you can see that 56% of early syphilis cases among men who have sex with men in California are HIV positive, and 44% are HIV negative. What about PrEP use among syphilis cases in California? This demonstrates the increasing proportion of PrEP use reported by HIV-negative men who have sex with men with early syphilis in California between 2015 and 2016. And note that this does not include San Francisco or Los Angeles, it's the rest of California. The highest rates of early syphilis in California are among men ages 25 to 29, but high rates occur across multiple age groups. There are persistent disparities in early syphilis rates by race ethnicity, with early syphilis male rates twice as high among African American males compared with white males. So to summarize, STDs are increasing in California. In 2015, men who have sex with men made up 70% of male early syphilis cases and 63% of male gonorrhea cases in California. A high proportion of the reported STD cases are in MSM who are HIV positive. Increasing percentages of HIV negative MSM with STDs are reporting PrEP use. Therefore, HIV care settings and clinics that prescribe PrEP provide opportunities to improve STD screening, including rectal and pharyngeal testing among populations at risk for STDs. So let's talk about the screening recommendations, including rectal and pharyngeal STDs. So now we have our poll. We're going to open. So the question is, are rectal gonorrhea or chlamydia infections more likely to be symptomatic or asymptomatic in men who have sex with men? A, more likely symptomatic. B, more likely asymptomatic. C, don't know. That's why I'm here today. Or hopefully no one will not vote. Please vote. So we'll just wait a few more seconds because votes are still coming in.
Okay, so we'll close now. Okay, so you can see that most people voted that rectal gonorrhea and chlamydia infections were more likely to be, sorry, what did we say? More likely asymptomatic, which is, which is correct. And we're going to talk more about that as we, as we go on. So I wanted to start off with some background information about the interaction of STDs and HIV. STDs can increase the risk of HIV acquisition and transmission by numerous mechanisms, including reducing barriers to viral entry, increasing the number and density of HIV-1 receptor positive cells via the inflammation induced by the STDs, contributing to an imbalance of protective vaginal flora, and increasing HIV concentrations in plasma, genital lesions, or secretions. There are also data out of New York, among other places, that have shown that STDs predict future HIV risk. Among HIV-negative men who have sex with men, one in 15 with rectal gonorrhea or chlamydia infection were diagnosed with HIV within one year. And among MSM with primary or secondary syphilis, one in 18 were diagnosed with HIV within one year. The risk was lower, but not low, for MSM with no diagnosed rectal STD or syphilis infection in this analysis. So what are our guidelines? The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommend the following STD screening for men who have sex with men. All MSM should be tested for HIV, syphilis, urethral gonorrhea and chlamydia, rectal gonorrhea and chlamydia if they've had anal sex, and pharyngeal gonorrhea if they've had oral sex. And these tests should be performed at least annually and more frequently up to every three months if they have high risk or increased risk, which includes having multiple sex partners, anonymous sex partners, drug use in conjunction with sex, having high risk partners. HSV2 uh, serology is a consider recommendation from the CDC. All MSM should be tested for hepatitis B, and if they're not immune, they should be vaccinated. And hepatitis C testing should be done in HIV positive MSM at least annually and more frequently depending on risk. In terms of anal cancer uh, screening and HIV positive MSM, data are insufficient to recommend routine screening per the CDC, but some centers do perform anal pap smears and high resolution anoscopy. This shows STD screening recommendations for HIV positive men and women. And it's similar to the prior slide, but note that HIV positive women should be tested for trichomonas and screened for cervical cancer. The United States Preventive Services Task Force recently came out with updated syphilis screening recommendations for non-pregnant adults and adolescents, in which they recommended screening for syphilis infection in persons who are at increased risk for infection. This was given a grade A recommendation, and the strongest screening recommendations were for men who have sex with men and HIV-infected individuals. Here are some data that demonstrate the high prevalence of bacterial STDs among MSM. These are data out of the STD Surveillance Network, which is a national surveillance effort in select STD clinics throughout the country, and shows the proportion of men who have sex with men attending these STD clinics with primary and secondary syphilis, gonorrhea, or chlamydia, stratified by HIV status, with HIV positive indicated by red and HIV negative indicated by blue. And you can see that there's high positivity across the board for syphilis, urethral gonorrhea, pharyngeal pharyngeal gonorrhea, rectal gonorrhea, urethral chlamydia, and rectal chlamydia. And particularly high positivity for rectal gonorrhea and rectal chlamydia among HIV positive men who have sex with men. This slide estimates the proportion of persons living with HIV in California that were diagnosed with an STD in 2014. Of over 124,000 persons living with HIV in California, 7% were co-infected with at least one STD, chlamydia, gonorrhea, or syphilis that year. This 7% is likely an underestimate because this refers only to individuals who were diagnosed with STDs. And we know since so many STDs are asymptomatic, particularly rectal and pharyngeal infections, Many are under-tested and under-diagnosed. And most of these patients were male, and the majority were men who have sex with men. 
And here we see the high incidence of STDs among individuals taking PrEP at Kaiser Permanente San, San Francisco. In one study, after 12 months of PrEP use, the incidence of any STD was 50%, and the incidence of a rectal STD was 33% among this cohort of individuals taking PrEP. Note that there were zero HIV infections in that time period. So given the CDC guidelines recommending screening for STDs among MSM, including those on PrEP, and among HIV-positive individuals, and given these data that show high positivity of STDs among HIV-positive MSM at STD clinics and in California, and high STD incidence among a population taking PrEP in San Francisco, what else do we need to know regarding screening for these infections? Well, as I've mentioned, and as many of you demonstrated in the poll, you know, the majority of rectal infections in men who have sex with men are asymptomatic. So these are data from San Francisco City Clinic that showed that rectal chlamydia and gonorrhea infections were approximately 85% asymptomatic. Compared to urethral chlamydia infections, which were usually symptomatic, although could be asymptomatic, and urethral gonorrhea infections, which are symptomatic the majority of the time in men. This shows the high proportion of rectal and pharyngeal chlamydia and gonorrhea infections associated with a negative urine test. And these are data, again, out of the STD surveillance network, looking at men who have sex with men, over 21,000, who attended STD clinics. And what you could see is that for, if you look at positive pharyngeal gonorrhea infections, 74% of the time, this was associated with a concurrent negative urethral test. So if you're testing only the urine, you're missing pharyngeal gonorrhea tests. For positive rectal gonorrhea tests, 72% of the time, this was associated with a concurrent negative urethral test. And looking at, all the way on the right at positive rectal chlamydia tests, 88% of the time, this was associated with a concurrent negative urethral test. So we have to screen the site. So just to show another study to demonstrate that, if we screen only a, with a urine nucleic acid test for gonorrhea or chlamydia, will we identify pharyngeal and rectal infections? And we'll miss the majority of cases. These are data, again, out of San Francisco that showed if you test only the urine for chlamydia, you miss 77% of chlamydia infections. And if you test only the urine for gonorrhea, you miss 95% of gonorrhea infections. So here are the CDC recommendations in an MMWR published in 2014 for the lab-based detection of chlamydia and gonorrhea. And what they found were that NATs were recommended for the detection of genital tract infections in men and women with and without symptoms. The optimal specimen types are first catch urine for men and self-collected vaginal swabs for women. NATs were also recommended for the detection of rectal and oropharyngeal infections. These are more sensitive than culture. They're not FDA approved for rectal or pharyngeal specimens, but they remain the preferred and CDC recommended testing method over culture. So although NATs haven't been cleared for the rectal and pharyngeal testing um, with chlamydia and gonorrhea, they can be used by labs that have undergone validation procedures and met all the regulatory requirements for an off-label procedure. And there are multiple large commercial labs that accept these specimens. There's also an opportunity for self-collection, which might also require validation, I'll talk about in a second. And then the PTC and the California Department of Public Health can assist with lab protocols and billing codes. And here on this slide, we have some of the NAT lab ordering and billing codes for your reference, and these slides will be made available. Talking about self-collected rectal and pharyngeal STD testing, this has been found to be highly acceptable to patients with similar performance compared to clinician-collected specimens. Self-collection can be performed at the lab along with a blood draw or urine collection or in the exam room before or after the provider visit, allowing for potential streamlining of the collection of the specimens. It potentially can save a patient an office visit. It can save the provider time. And standing orders in electronic medical records may facilitate patient-collected testing. I just wanted to show one example um, that this is available online at the I Want the Kit website of patient instructions for self-collection of a rectal swab, and there are other examples of these as well. So despite high prevalence of STDs and guidelines recommending tests, 
there's suboptimal STD screening among men who have sex with men in HIV care. This reports the percent of sexually active HIV positive MSM that were screened for STDs in the medical monitoring project. And you can see that over half of the individuals were screened for syphilis and only approximately 20% were screened for chlamydia or gonorrhea. In San Francisco in the medical monitoring project, many sexually active HIV positive clinic patients who self-reported being tested for gonorrhea or chlamydia did not have evidence of testing when data were abstracted from the medical record and testing was low, 35% for gonorrhea and chlamydia. We have also seen that recommended annual gonorrhea and chlamydia screening, demonstrated by the darkest line in this figure, lags behind lipid, lipid screening, which is the light gray line, in seven HIV care clinics studied here. So where do we go from here? Well, we need to take a sexual history in order to identify appropriate clinical interventions. So let's discuss methods and best practices for routinely conducting a sexual history. How do we know if our patients are at risk for STDs and HIV? Infections are commonly asymptomatic, so relying on report of symptoms is not adequate, and discussions about risk behaviors are necessary. A basic sexual history is important because it guides our clinical services and prevention efforts by allowing the provider to individualize STD and HIV-related care and prevention efforts with the client. An accurate sexual history helps direct the physical exam and decisions about STD testing and screening, which can lead to the detection of disease, subsequent treatment, and prevention of serious sequelae. The sexual history and risk assessment also give the provider important information to use in counseling the patient regarding risk reduction efforts. When done in a clear, non-judgmental way, good rapport is established between the patient and the provider, and the patient can feel comfortable discussing his or her personal situation and asking questions. It also enables referrals to specialized services, such as substance abuse services. Patients and providers may have concerns related to confidentiality of the information discussed, and providers may have some discomfort discussing sexual issues. They might not know what to ask or how to ask it and then they don't know what to do with the information. And they might be concerned about getting it done in the limited time that they have to do everything else. Barriers to taking a sexual history may include structural barriers, including limited time for appointments in which we have to cover many other pressing items, reimbursement concerns, issues with deprioritizing sexual health in general and STD prevention in particular in light of other medical issues, and dealing with the acute issues as they arise rather than taking a preventative, proactive approach. Providers may lack familiarity with the content or the language, may think taking a sexual history is harder than it actually is, and may have inadequate training or practice. And providers may have discomfort discussing sexual health. There's a great quote from the Institute of Medicine from 20 years ago in the hidden epidemic confronting STDs. Ironically, it may require greater intimacy to discuss sex than to engage in it. So how do we begin a sexual history? First, you want to acknowledge the personal nature of the subject matter. I know this is very personal information. Normalize the conversation and emphasize confidentiality. I talk to all of my patients about their sexual history because it's an important part of their health. Before I ask my questions, I want to let you know that everything we talk about is confidential. Explain how the information will help you care for the patient. This information will help me understand if there's issues with your health that I can help with. One framework for approaching a sexual history and, and asking comprehensive questions is the five Ps. Partners, practices, past history of STDs, protection from STDs, and pregnancy plans. Partners, have your sex partners been males, females, or both? Sexual practices, what type of sex did you have? Past STDs, what STDs have you had in the past? What do you do to prevent getting an STD or HIV? and pregnancy history and plans. Are you and your partner planning on having a baby or getting pregnant in the next year? Or what do you and your girlfriend use to prevent pregnancy? Some general considerations for taking a sexual history are to make no assumptions. We should ask all patients about the gender of their sex partner and the number of sex partners. And to ask about specific sexual practices, including vaginal, anal, and oral sex. 
Also, we should be clear and avoid medical jargon and, try and clarify when necessary. And also be specific in our questions. I have one colleague who um, was taking care of his HIV primary care patient, and he asked him if he was sexually active, and the patient said no. And then he delved further and said, well, when was the last time you had sex? And the patient said three days ago. So sometimes we need to be extremely clear in our language as well. Other considerations for sexual history taking, be tactful and respectful, avoid showing surprise, don't use a family member as a translator, and to be, be non-judgmental. Recognize patient concerns, recognize our own biases, and avoid value-laden language, such as, you should, why didn't you, I think you. So some examples of neutral language, instead of, why didn't you use a condom, ask, what made it difficult to use a condom in that situation? Instead of, do you tell your partners that you're HIV positive? Ask, what's your approach to discussing HIV status with partners? Instead of, why didn't you finish your medicine? Ask, what made it difficult to finish your medicine? What if time constraints don't allow issues to be fully discussed? Well, you can schedule follow-up visits, refer to a counselor if you have that available in your clinic, offer patient information sheets, and refer to specialized care source and or hotline based on the conversation, such as support groups, substance abuse treatment, and domestic violence referrals. Helping clients change behavior might begin with changing some of our own. If you don't routinely take sexual histories or if you ask, are you sexually active, then stop there. Give it a try delving into a more comprehensive sexual history. Be willing to practice a new skill and normalize it for yourself, and it'll be normalized for the patient, and allow us to tailor the care that they need and order appropriate STD tests, provide appropriate risk reduction counseling, and work on recognizing our biases and keeping them in check. I wanted to mention um, Tasha, which is a tablet-based sexual health application that is a self-administered Sorry, there's a Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go on. Sorry, there was an interruption. Tasha is a tablet-based sexual health application that's a self-administered patient survey and assists with conducting routine risk assessment with clinical decision support to help clinicians save time and improve patient care. Here's an example of a question on the tablet. So the patient would be filling this out themselves. In the past year, have you had sex with men, women, or both? And this is an example of a provider report that summarizes the patient's answers, provides recommendations for STD testing according to national guidelines, and has prompts with suggestions for education and counseling. My colleagues here at the PTC have additional information about Tasha if you're interested in learning more after the webinar. And it's also attached to the resources. Before I move on to the next section, I'll just mention that expert STD clinical services are a key principle in reducing HIV in the United States and they're supported in the National HIV AIDS Strategy for the U.S. For the final section, we'll talk about chlamydia and gonorrhea treatment and a couple of examples of complicated STDs. So this slide shows chlamydia treatment recommendations, the CDC STD treatment guidelines for adolescents and adults. The recommended regimens for non-pregnant individuals with chlamydia are azithromycin 1 gram orally in a single dose or doxycycline 100 milligrams orally twice a day for seven days. For pregnant women with chlamydia, the, recommenda the recommended regimen is only azithromycin 1 gram orally in a single dose. And for chlamydia, test of cure is recommended at three to four weeks after the completion of treatment for pregnant women only. This shows recommendations for gonorrhea treatment for genital, rectal, and pharyngeal infections. Two drug therapy is recommended for all cases of gonorrhea with ceftriaxone 250 milligrams IM in a single dose 
plus azithromycin one gram orally. And these should both be administered regardless of chlamydia test results. So if the patient doesn't have chlamydia, they, if they have gonorrhea and no chlamydia, they still get treated with two drugs, ceftriaxone plus azithromycin, one gram orally. And these should be administered ideally at the same time and under directly observed therapy. Some treatment alternatives for gonorrhea for anogenital infections include cefixime 400 milligrams orally once plus azithromycin one gram orally, again, regardless of chlamydia co-infection. So this would be the regimen that's used for expedited partner therapy for patients with gonorrhea. But ideally, all patients with gonorrhea get treated with the recommended regimen of IM ceftriaxone plus azithromycin. In case of severe allergy, the alternative therapies are also two drugs for the treatment of gonorrhea. Either gentamicin 240 milligrams IM plus azithromycin two grams orally, or gemafloxacin 320 milligrams orally plus azithromycin two grams orally. Uh, I do wanna mention that gemifloxacin is not actually available in the United States right now, so your alternative regimen in case of a severe IgE-mediated allergy is the gentamicin plus azithromycin regimen. Who gets a test of cure for gonorrhea? Any patient with pharyngeal gonorrhea that's treated with an alternative regimen. So if they have pharyngeal gonorrhea and they are not treated with ceftriaxone plus azithromycin, they should have a test of cure to ensure clearance. And this should be obtained 14 days after treatment, either using culture or NAP. In any cases of suspected treatment failure, there should be a test conducted with culture and NAP. And you can consider a test of cure for gonorrhea if a patient is treated with a non-recommended -reg regimen or monotherapy. For the last section of this talk, I wanted to briefly discuss a couple of examples of complicated STDs that we may be seeing more of as we encounter increases in STDs. So in 2013, the um, CDC put out a drug, resistant, uh, a drug resistant threat report in which antibiotic resistant gonorrhea was one of three groups of organisms that was designated with a threat level of urgent, meaning that it's an immediate public health threat that requires urgent and aggressive action. And I'll mention that one of the ways to prevent and reduce the risk of resistant gonorrhea is to screen and treat rectal and pharyngeal gonorrhea and also to ensure appropriate two-drug therapy for gonorrhea with ceftriaxone and azithromycin. There have been treatment failures reported to cephalosporin. Ceftriaxone um, is a cephalosporin. And there have been oral cephalosporin treatment failures reported worldwide in multiple countries, including Japan, Hong Kong, England, and Canada. There have been no cephalosporin treatment failures reported in the United States to date. So to date, there's no documented treatment failure to the recommended regimen for gonorrhea with ceftriaxone plus azithromycin. There have been ceftriaxone treatment failures reported internationally in pharyngeal gonorrhea and a few isolates with high level ceftriaxone resistance reported. These are data from the National Gonococcal Isolate Surveillance Project that monitors trends in gonorrhea susceptibility to antibiotics. And this slide demonstrates that men who have sex with men are more likely to have gonorrhea with decreased susceptibility to ceftriaxone compared to men who have sex with women. So, so healthcare providers that care for men who have sex with men should be alert, even extra alert, for the potential for them to have gonorrhea that has decreased susceptibility to antibiotics or alert for uh, potential treatment failure. These are data from, again, that gonorrhea surveillance project, the gonococcal isolate surveillance project. And this is just looking in the California um, STD clinics that monitor the antimicrobial susceptibility trends for gonorrhea. And what you can see is that there's been an increase, particularly in 2016, in the percent of isolates with decreased susceptibility to azithromycin in California. So something, antibiotic resistant gonorrhea is definitely on our, um, we are alert for it, we're paying attention to it, and we want to control gonorrhea, screen for it, and treat it appropriately to prevent the further development of antibiotic resistant gonorrhea.
I did want to mention one azithromycin treatment failure in California a couple of years ago in which a patient presented with gonococcal urethritis, a male patient with symptomatic gonorrhea, and he had this vague history of a possible allergy to penicillin when he was a child, and the um, clinician opted to treat him with, at that time, what was the alternative regimen for the treatment of gonorrhea, which was azithromycin 2 grams, which is not recommended only anymore. Now it's always two drug therapy for the treatment of gonorrhea. And the patient's symptoms didn't go away. So he was treated and he just kept on having urethritis. And so he went back in and the clinician very astutely got a culture and susceptibilities and also delved more deeply into the patient's history of a drug allergy and determined that he didn't actually have an allergy to penicillin. The patient was treated then with ceftriaxin and doxycycline and his symptoms resolved and the gonorrhea that he had was found to be highly resistant to azithromycin. So I think that this is a good example of a case in which the patient should have been treated with the recommended therapy of two drug therapies, ceftriaxone plus azithromycin, but also the clinician was very astute in the sense that they got a, a culture and antimicrobial susceptibility testing when they realized that the patient might have failed treatment. This has been in the news. Um, just an article about the doctors fearing the spread of super gonorrhea across Britain. There was also a cluster in Hawaii in which a number of um, gonorrhea isolates were found to have decreased susceptibility to both ceftriaxone and azithromycin. There were no treatment failures, but it, was, but it raises alarms that we need to be alert for the potential of drug-resistant gonorrhea and treatment failures. So if you do have a suspected gonorrhea treatment failure, you should test with culture and nucleic acid amplification testing and call your local health department if you can't get gonorrhea culture. You should repeat treatment with gentamicin 240 milligrams IM plus azithromycin 2 grams orally. If you think it's likely the patient was reinfected, that this was not a treatment failure, but in fact the patient was reinfected, then it's okay to repeat treatment with the recommended regimen of ceftriaxone plus azithromycin. Any suspected gonorrhea treatment failure should be reported to your lo local health department within 24 hours. You should test and treat the partners, all partners in the last 60 days with the same regimen. And a test of cure should be obtained with culture and NAP. Now I'm gonna briefly talk about ocular syphilis, another complicated STD. So in around the end of 2014 and begin of, beginning of 2015, there was a cluster of ocular syphilis cases that was identified in Seattle and San Francisco. The majority of the cases of ocular syphilis were in men who have sex with men, the majority of whom were HIV infected. And several patients had permanent loss of vision. Uh, the California Department of Public Health put out a clinical advisory about ocular syphilis for clinicians to be alert for it and the CDC had a clinical advisory about ocular syphilis in the United States as well. Of the ocular syphilis cases described by the CDC in an MMWR last November, 93% were male, and 69% of males were men who have sex with men. 51% were HIV infected. I mentioned both antibiotic-resistant gonorrhea and ocular syphilis as two distinct but concerning STD issues that disproportionately affect men who have sex with men and should be on the radar of clinicians. So to conclude, bacterial STDs are highly prevalent among men who have sex with men and they are increasing. Sexual history taking is a core component of guiding recommended clinical and preventive services for our patients. STD testing for syphilis and gonorrhea and chlamydia including rectal and pharyngeal sites, is essential to identify asymptomatic infections, reduce transmission, and identify candidates at risk for HIV acquisition and initiate on PrEP. As STDs increase, we need to be vigilant in our efforts to reduce associated morbidity, including antibiotic-resistant gonorrhea and ocular syphilis. In HIV care settings and clinics that prescribe PrEP, provide opportunities to improve STD screening and sexual health promotion among populations at risk for STDs. I wanted to point out some clinical guidelines and resources for you. 
So the CDC STD treatment guidelines are available online. They were most recently updated in 2015. And they have a vast amount of information about screening recommendations and treatments and resources. The STD Clinical Consultation Network is available at stdccn.org. So if you have a question about the treatment of your patient, any STD-related treatment question or other questions or requests for resources, you can enter that in online here and someone will get back to you. You can also call 510-620-3400 with STD questions. And there's also a free STD treatment guidelines app that the CDC created. You can search in your app store for STD space TX, and um, you can find this. And this has really handy, it's a really handy resource as well. And make sure that it's free, don't pay for anything, because then it's not the right one. I just wanted to briefly acknowledge some of my colleagues who helped with the preparation of these slides. And that concludes this portion, and I thank you, and please let me know if you have any questions. I think we're taking questions into the chat box. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Stoltley, for that very comprehensive and excellent presentation. And I just wanted to remind folks, because we've been uh, gathering questions during the, the webinar, and several of you have asked if slides will be available, and they absolutely will um, at the beginning of the webinar, we um, included some poll questions, and I think we're going to include them again. And one of the, the important ones is for you to provide your email address. Because we did not require pre-registration for this webinar, um, that's one thing that would be important for us to have, and we can send you those, um, those uh, uh, slides when we're done. We're also going to um, provide them um, and make them available as resources, and you might have remembered that uh, Majel Arnold at the beginning of the webinar um, alerted you to some other resources that we have available here in the resource pod. One is the Office of AIDS Integrated Prevention and Care Plan. I know that we have a lot of prevention and care participants, so many of you may be involved in clinical care, many of you are involved in uh, prevention for HIV and STD, so that will be a very valuable resource. When Dr. Stoltley alluded to the um, the TASHA, which is a tablet-assisted sexual health assessment. We have a demonstration video that's also available in the resources. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to get started with a few questions. And um, we, uh, again, um, for those of you that didn't type your questions, and if you have any, please do that. But we're going to go ahead and get started with the ones that we have so far. And so um, so I think you want to Sure. So, so Julie's going to go ahead and answer one of the questions regarding NAT. One, I think one of the questions was just what is a NAT? I'm sorry for not um, specifying that. So NAT stands for Nucleic Acid Amplification Test. And it's basically a molecular test for gonorrhea and chlamydia. And for instance, if you give a urine sample, that is being tested by NAT. So a urine sample that is being tested for gonorrhea and chlamydia is tested with NAT. It's the technology and it's the type of test. And it's the vast majority of gonorrhea and chlamydia tests in California and in this country currently are conducted via that type of test, a NAT test. A test of cure, which was another question, so just to clarify what that is, test of cure is a test that would be conducted uh, for chlamydia three or four weeks after treatment. For gonorrhea would be probably about two weeks after treatment. And this is a test to ensure that the patient clears the infection. And that is, um, that is recommended in just those specific scenarios that I mentioned. So if a patient has ongoing symptoms, you would get a test of cure. If they're pregnant and have chlamydia, they get a test of cure. If for gonorrhea, if um, they have pharyngeal gonorrhea, they're treated with an alternative regimen, you want to document clearance with a test of cure. If you think they have a suspected treatment failure, you should get a test of cure. So there's specific times where you would get a test of cure. Um, I do want to mention, and I didn't put this in this talk, that all patients with gonorrhea or chlamydia should have repeat testing three months or so after they're treated because their likelihood of reinfection is so high that we really want to identify those, those repeat infections and make sure that patients get, um, get the appropriate treatment if they are, in fact, infected. Great. Okay. Thanks, Julie. We're going to so, other questions. So another question you might be able to answer uh, that came across, um, well, one is an easy 
one, and I think it might have been covered and another respondent might have responded, but um, one person wanted to know what the last P stood for. The last P was, um, you know, family planning, pregnancy planning, pregnancy prevention, if you're um, talking to a heterosexual couple, but I think more broadly to ask to ask all of our patients about what they're planning about for their for their families and are there are they planning for um, children? The other the other five P's are partners asking about sex partners, practices asking about se uh, sexual practices, past STDs, and prevention of STDs and HIV. And the last one, pregnancy history and plans. Great, thanks, Julie. Um, somebody um, noted that they were finding it difficult to assess recent syphilis versus latent infection when assessing. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about resources or... Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I didn't get into the staging of syphilis just because it's really, it's, it would be beyond the scope of this, of this talk. Um, I will just mention before I very briefly describe it that um, we do have a syphilis clinical webinar on the PTC website that can be accessed for free that Dr. Sharon Adler did just last year, so it's really up to date, that goes through all of the clinical presentations of syphilis, the staging of syphilis, treatment recommendations for syphilis. So that is available on the, P at the California PTC website. But basically, in terms of staging syphilis, the, we stage into either early syphilis, which is syphilis acquired in the last year, or late syphilis, which would be syphilis acquired over a year ago. And if the patient has latent syphilis, meaning they have no signs or symptoms, and we're trying, and I think that's what this question was getting at, and we're trying to determine if they're early or late, if we can't confirm that they were infected sometime in the last year. So ways that we would do that would be um, a clear physical exam sometime in the last year that documented signs of primary secondary syphilis. Um, an RPR that had a fourfold increase in the prior year, if the patient was a contact to um, uh, another patient with early syphilis, or if this was the only time that that patient could have acquired syphilis. So if they'd had their sexual debut and they'd never had sex before the last year. So then we would know it was early syphilis. If we can't determine that, then we stage the patient as essentially latent of unknown duration. And the reason we make these determinations of early versus late is that this determines what the patient is treated with. So if it's early syphilis, they're treated with 5 4 which is benzocene penicillin G, 2.4 million units IM in a single dose. But if it's late syphilis, then they, it's benzocene penicillin G, 2.4 million units IM once a week for three weeks. And so determining if they acquired syphilis in the last year, or if it's unknown, or they acquired it a long time ago, that determines what they're treated with. Great, thank you, Julie. Um, and this question, I know that is maybe a little bit variable in terms of, of your perspective on this, but one of the questions came in regarding um, certain uh, clinics or programs uh, covering suffixing costs. I don't know if you have mm -hmm. anything to say about that. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't have really information about that, but if you want to send us a specific email, we can try and get more, more information and get back to you about, about your specific question. Yeah. I know that the, the coverage will often vary based on, you know, type of coverage that a patient has or the providers, as this one questioner noted. It sounded like that was a family packed question, mm -hmm. but we can try to work with you on that. Um, and then there are other questions around, um, the cost and, and uh, others as well. I, I do see a question about how to get a DIS on board, and it's, um, it's a little bit of a, a broad question, but I will tell folks that there are um, very specific uh, training courses for disease intervention specialists that um, are also part of our national uh, network of prevention training centers, and we have one of those uh, centers um, here um, as part of the Prevention Training Center. I'm not quite sure what the specific nature of that question was, um, but um, if somebody wants to type in a more specific question, we can certainly uh, attempt to answer that. Again, I know that we have um, clinical and non-clinical folks on the line, which is great, but um, 
Well, I can say for now. There was another question about hepatitis C testing for all MSM versus just for HIV positive MSM. That's a very good question. So um, there's standard recommendations for testing HIV positive MSM for hepatitis C on entry into care and then at least annually and then more frequently depending on their risk. In terms of hep C testing for um, HIV negative MSM, I, I would say there's not standardized CDC guidelines on that yet, but there are definitely clinical practices that are doing that given all of um, the innovations and in treatment for hepatitis C that have happened in the last few years. And also there have been at least a couple of documented cases of uh, sexually transmitted hepatitis C in um, HIV negative MSM who are on PrEP. And so I think that there are clinical practices that are screening for Hep C among HIV negative MSM, but there's not standard CDC guidelines on that yet. We're screening for other, we're looking for other questions right now. Yeah, so we just have another minute or two left for questions, and I, I thought I would also kind of open it up to our OA partners to see if there's anything you'd like to either comment on or any question. Um, we know that Dr. Stolte covered a variety of issues um, regarding STD screening, including extragenital testing, sexual history taking, which we know are both extremely important. But um, Majel or if any of your colleagues have any last questions or comments, I want to make sure to offer that opportunity for you all as well. Thanks, Alice. So this is Majel. So at this time, we don't have any questions. We do want to thank, again, Dr. Stolte for uh, a very, um, very informative and um, educational uh, presentation. Um, just looking at all of the different uh, comments from, from folks, it, it definitely um, stirred up a lot of uh, questions. So we're happy that the slides will be available as well as uh, the recording of this webinar. So thank you again for putting this all together. We really, um, this is a really good um, webinar, training webinar. Great, um, and, and we do notice that there have been a few other questions that have come in, and what we are going to do is we will um, address them, and because um, I believe we have just about everybody's email address, we will make them available, so when we make the archives web webinar available, we will also include a copy of some of the questions that we weren't able to get to. Um, I'm just trying to be sensitive of our time, unless you feel like you can answer something in about 30 seconds, Julie. I know there was a question that... that there, was a qu there was a quick question about pharyngeal chlamydia screening, and so there's not, there, there's not a recommendation for testing for pharyngeal chlamydia because um, some prior data have not shown that there's um, a high prevalence of chlamydia in the pharynx. It's not considered really a hospitable environment for chlamydia. Uh, that said, most tests in the pharynx are bundled. So if you're screening for gonorrhea in the throat, you're also getting chlamydia. And if you identify it, you should treat it. And so um, those are the screening guidelines, but often we end up testing for pharyngeal gonorrhea and chlamydia. And then if you have a positive test, it should be treated. Thank you, Julie. And again, just to reiterate, there's a lot of resources and information um, around many of the areas that Julie covered on our website at CaliforniaPTC.com. We also, um, again, will make these slides available. So I just wanted to thank everybody for your participation in this webinar. And if you have any questions regarding STD screening or extragenital screening, sexual history taking, et cetera, please feel free to send us a question and we'll do our best to get back to you. Um, thank you all for participating.